welcome to The Upshot, Multi World Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm the publisher, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Josh Mansfield. Happy Memorial Day, everybody. Want to just say thank you to our veterans out there and I uh, hope everybody had a nice time. We, we had terrible, cold, rainy weather in New York all weekend until about one o'clock yesterday afternoon when the sun came through and it turned into a beautiful day. Had a little barbecue at a park by my house and man, it is just nice to know summer is on its way, Josh. Completely agree. My uh, wife, brother-in-law and I, we went out to town a little farther away from us and got in a lot of rounds of disc golf. So we had a disc golf weekend. Yeah, it was 80 degrees, sunny, beautiful weather all weekend for us. So, Uh, Speaking of Memorial Day, ESPN ran a little segment on SportsCenter on Sunday, one of their features that they run from time to time. And uh, it was about uh, disc golf. It was about a... A co- well, really, a, a, a father and son and a story about um, suicide prevention, mental health awareness. It's really nice. You can you can watch the full feature. It's uh, up on Ulti World Disc Golf site if you didn't catch it on SportsCenter. And uh, just a shout out to the organization Disc for Life, which has been kind of growing and I'm sure will grow a, a, a lot more after this feature. Uh, people writing on the backs of discs. Uh, you know, play this disc on the next hole, leave it in the following basket. If it's on 18, take it to take it in your bag and play it at the next course on hole one. Um, and these discs are traveling all around the United States. And I'm sure the world at this point and uh, helping raise awareness about mental health issues, which, uh, you know, I think disc golf is, is a sport that is uniquely uh, situated for helping people deal with personal issues or mental health problems. I mean, I've heard so, so many stories of people saying, you know, disc golf really helped me, right? Like it's, it's, some people say it saved me and that ability to go out there, be outside, whether you're playing solo or with a group and, you know, just feel like, Hey, I, I'm finding purpose. Uh, that can really help people through tough times. So shout out to those, those folks over at disc for life and a just really nice story on ESPN. Yeah, it was a great piece. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think additionally, uh, what's important is that it, it it's a reflection of where the sport is headed. Because if you see, I mean, the NFL, for example, they always do bits uh, on whether it be mental health, veterans, uh, education. I mean, they, they always have those those different bits in terms of like the social impact that sports can have because of the organizational capacity of them. I think the same is true of disc golf. Like we have the capacity as a community through organizational structures, both formal at tournaments and informal through social media to affect change. And it's good to see that we are utilizing the sport in order to do so and, and take care of those who who love the sport. And so I, I think it's a, it's a good trend to see in disc golf as well. So reminder, this is our start of a, two times per week format here on the upshot we're kind of figuring it out (laughs) we hope you're excited we're excited but what this means is that we're going to have a chance to react to the weekend's news tournaments uh in show one and then show two get you ready for the upcoming weekend you know and if there's no tournament we'll be able to take on topics that uh otherwise may not fit into the news cycle so you know we've always done this kind of content on the upshot it's just Sometimes we end up with a show like last week that runs two and a half hours and the content may be good, but we want the show to be about an hour or less every single every single time you tune in. So uh, hopefully you enjoy that. I, I did say we would be out Tuesday morning, but of course, uh, I forgot that it was Memorial Day. So the weekend got pushed back. We're recording on Tuesday, so it will be out either late Tuesday or early Wednesday. And then our, our next show will be out on Thursday. Um so we hope you enjoy it. We're going to talk, of course, about the Masters Cup right now. And so let's just dive in. Uh, I don't want to bury the headline. Adam Hammes in MPO takes down his first Elite Series win at Masters Cup. He finishes 33 under, narrowly edging out James Proctor, who's not even on the lead card. He came surging late and al- almost caught Adam, but it wasn't quite enough. Uh, Adam Hammes... After you know having lots of moments of exceptional play over the last couple of years and winning some tournaments off the tour, 
finally gets his first Elite Series win at Masters Cup, uh, making it two for two for this tournament in delivering first-time National Tour and Elite Series winners after Garrett Gerthy won the tournament in 2019. Of course, it was not played in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So Adam Hammes, he's been heating up a little bit, and I got to give you props, Josh. You had him second in your picks. You didn't have the resolve <laughs> to put him first. But what about what about Adam Hammes' play lately? What, had you putting him inside your top five and feeling like he was going to play well this weekend at uh, in Santa Cruz? Uh, well, a couple of things. The first of which is I, I think Adam Hammes has been slowly heating up. And so, uh, you know, I picked him maybe two weeks ago uh, or something like that as well. Uh, a little early. Uh, I jumped the gun just to touch on that one. You were uh, right, but you were early. <clears throat> right, right, right. Uh, you know, he, he, so he's been getting, he's been moving up. He's been trending upwards. Um, and so it felt, you know, I think he had a couple top five finishes in the past couple weeks. So, uh, you know, I felt like it was time to, to give him the nod. Um, but the second thing, and, and the thing that's always impressed me about Adam Ham is, I mean, that guy's putter is amazing. Um, I don't know what he does. I don't know how he does it. Uh, but I wish I knew how to putt like that. Um, and so, you know, on a course like De La Viega, it just feels like a putter is important. Um, uh, which is ironic because the last, you know, winner, Garrett Gerthy, isn't known for his putting. He's not known for his driving. So I guess it was a, a flip storyline here, but, um, Adam Ham is delivered on the putter. That's for sure. I mean, he was locked this weekend. Absolutely locked in this weekend. I mean, we're going to go through a bunch of stats here that I think are very interesting um, as we as we kind of talk about Adam Hammes's tournament. But I mean, let's just look at a couple things off the top. You know, ninety two percent from Circle One X this weekend, which was good for first. You know, that's that that's the benchmark, right? Ninety percent is the benchmark in MPO for elite putting. Typically top putters at a tournament are going to go 90% plus. And uh, he was also 33% from circle two. And I think, you know, 30% is probably what I would consider the elite benchmark cutoff uh, in that department. And so, you know, it's no surprise that he was first on the weekend in strokes gained on the putting green. Now, here's what's interesting as we dig a little deeper here, right? And, and you don't, you could just watch the coverage to see the putter in action. I mean, in the final round, he was right there with Kevin Jones. Like that, it was close pretty much the entire round. Um, and he has a huge birdie putt on hole two, and then he hits an even bigger putt on hole three to take two strokes off Kevin Jones right there. I mean, the, the putt on three was insane, like sixty feet, like dead straight laser beam into the chains. Um, his putting stroke is so consistent and it's why you see him year after year being one of the best circle two putters on tour because even if he's off a little bit to start a season or to have a tournament that's off here or there like that consistency it's like free throw shooting you know and he finds that rhythm and he certainly had it this weekend um so here's a stat for you in the final round, he was six for 13 on circle two putts. All right. And, and that's a big reason that I think that he ended up winning this tournament. There were a couple moments in that final round where Kevin Jones parked a hole, had like a, you know, 10 foot birdie putt and Hamas is like in the woods. He hit one from a knee on hole nine out of the woods that just stole a stroke from Kevin Jones, basically. Like Kevin was about to tap in and Hamas buries one you know, from outside the circle from a knee. And there were just multiple moments like that where he saved a momentum swing from going against him by hitting a huge putt. Now, here's here's a fact for you, Josh. He finished the weekend sixth in strokes gained from tee to green and first in putting. Fair enough, right? I mean, you know, sure. strong performance tee to green, top level performance in the putting green, you win the tournament. Great. It feels like a Heather Young. Yeah. Like, I mean, we've yeah. seen this story before. Yeah, absolutely. His strokes gained from tee to green 
was nine. Again, that means he gained nine strokes compared to the average player in the field from tee to green. In putting, he was 9.69. This is the first time all year that an MPO, a player won a tournament, finishing with their putting strokes gained higher than their tee to green performance. And really, it's not even close. It's not even close. Elite Series tournament so far this season, we've seen T to green strokes gained be in the 20 to 25 range most of the time. 18, 19, up to 25. And it was nine for Hamas this weekend, and that was close to the best. So this course, this De La course, you're, there's just not that much separation to be found from T to green compared to so many of these other courses that we've seen this weekend. And let's remind, let's remember what Paul McBeth said in the press conference before the tournament. It feels like the first time we're playing disc golf, a disc golf course this year. Uh, and just saying that, you know, we've, we've played so many golf course layouts uh, to start the season. And it really is a different beast. I know we're going to talk about no live coverage, but, you know, there's been chat about, is the Masters Cup a, an event that deserves to be on the Pro Tour? I think that this is indicative of a type of course that we need desperately on the on the Pro Tour. And the reason why is because, like you said, there wasn't as much. And typically, those numbers are flipped, right? Like you have a crazy tee to green, like we talked about. 20. 20, 25 strokes, right? Like that average, <clears throat> to win the tournament, you need to be driving better than everybody else, hands down. And then <clears throat> after that, your putting is pretty similar to everyone else's. FPO side, this clear case in point, right? Like top five, F top four FPO, uh, with the exception of, I believe, Kona Panis, all had incredible strokes in terms of T to green. And then they were all pretty similar and pretty meh in terms of putting uh, because you separate yourself with the drive and then after that it's just you're cleaning up and I think that this course shows us how to get better putting and more exciting putting the answer isn't uh, smaller baskets and I don't want to pick a fight I don't want to I don't, I don't want to go down that road We're not I don't think the answer is smaller baskets but I think the answer is are greens like De La Viega where if you choose to run a putt, there's a real risk that you roll away because of it. That even if you have a good drive, if you come up short, then you have an enormous tree that's fallen down right in front of you. Um, that you have brush or a bush like inside the circle that because you didn't control your skip, you are now deep in and to make your putt requires something special. It requires a different putt, whether it be straddle, knee, a long spin putt. It it forces players to use a variety of putting, and it separates the best putters from the ones who are so accustomed to just having to make a lot of circle one putts because they're parked every time. And that's why Adam Hammes won this weekend because he's an excellent putter with versatile skills. But I think it's also what makes De La Viega great disc golf is because it requires you to distinguish yourself on the putting green, where a lot of courses don't require that uh, at all. I, I found this coverage incredibly refreshing. I really did. I, I mean, I, I, I like to watch people bomb it 600 feet as much as anybody else. But when you watch it week in and week out, it's a little dull. It's like, okay, like you can really throw it far. <laughs> There's something special to me about watching somebody have to laser beam a shot 400 feet with very little lateral motion in order to have a clean tee shot. And players who like to play more of a flex type game or have, you know, don't have certain shots, don't have the versatility of the amazing forehand, by the way, that we saw from Adam Hammes on display this weekend, uh, got punished because the, the, the margins get smaller. And if you miss a little bit, you catch, you clip a tree and you shoot down into the canyon and you're having a scramble from a horrible position. And I think 
I, I saw I see complaints. I mean, I see this every year, but I certainly saw them this weekend about that it's too random of a course, right? There's too much randomness. There's too many random rollaways. There's too many random, you know, hits and things. But I'm like, but what? What's the problem with that? Like, I I don't I don't think we necessarily need every single course to lay out optimally for the Rickies, Pauls, and Calvins of the world. Like, do we have to have everything be just ultra long and like very consistent? You know, there is skill to playing a course like this, and you can't quantify this stat. But how many players laid up putts? because they were afraid of roll away or because there was danger behind the basket and you know it dinged their circle two percentage or it dinged their c1x percentage uh it gives an advantage to players who have the confidence to run putts knowing that they're gonna make them right adam hammis gets the advantage of being that elite level putter from 30 to 50 feet relative to his peers because he's able to attack in situations where other players are either fully laying up or giving a sort of a half run. And I think that that is welcome on tour. I, I just found the entire experience like, wow, this is like nothing else we've watched this season. It's like, it's not a giant golf course with monster bomb hyzer shots. Like it's more technical it's more interesting like some of the holes are short but require a really good tee shot in order to be in a birdie position and it, I, I you know i'm sure the pros feel mixed about it largely depending on what their skill set is you know if, if this course kind of course suits you i'm sure you love playing master's cup and if it doesn't then you probably wish it wasn't on tour but as a fan as a viewer I couldn't be more excited about watching a totally different style of disc golf. It just, it felt much more interesting than the typical tournament. I, I completely agree. And here's, here's the other thing I want to say about randomness. Two things, I guess. First thing, uh, I know pros say, you know, like, Oh, I hate randomness. I don't think it's fair to say though, that like, cause some people will say, Oh, well the randomness is the reason why, you get new winners at the Master Cup, right? Garrett Gerthy, Adam Hammes. Um, I don't buy that because uh, that's not how randomness works. Uh, randomness, yeah, randomness happens, but randomness affects everybody equally, right? It should like, be normally distributed. It, it should. And, and maybe one year in particular, someone gets a really, 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 really bad year. That happens, right? It's, 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 it, it might happen, but it should be normally distributed. Everyone's going to have those randomness. It, it looks like, oh, wow, well, Paul should have been parked there. Uh, and so it feels like Paul's getting the bad end of the break. Everyone's getting affected by this randomness. So I don't buy that as being a convincing reason as to why, um, you know, uh, someone like Calvin Heimberg, for example, had a terrible weekend. We'll talk about that. But the second thing I think I love about randomness is it challenges something I think that is crucial in a player's game, and that is their ability to continue to perform under duress, right? I think that a lot of times you'll see those top players when they start playing poorly, they just are like, like they, they have to self-correct. They have to play better. Um, but it's also oftentimes like their own fault where they are, right? It, it, on a golf course, you're not really, I mean, even LVC has some randomness with like the, the bunkers five feet right and you're out, you know, you've got a hazard five feet left and you're in. But I think then that to have a roll away on a perfect drive and then to have to compose yourself again to make a putt uh, or to scramble because you hit the first available tree and are now 150 feet right into the woods. Like, I think that randomness requires then that you have the type of composure and self-awareness that is necessary for a pro to have if they want to be an elite disc golfer. And so I think it's valuable to watch. Adam Hammes, case in point. Round two, you could see a couple of times when Adam Hammes was getting really frustrated with himself. He was having poor drives. He was missing circle two putts relative to his weekend. Round two wasn't as great. 11% circle two putting on the weekend. Just not, not a good round uh, for circle two putting. 100% from C1X though. Didn't miss a putt in round two, despite visible frustration and the fact that he was like very clearly flustered in that round, did not miss a single putt inside the circle. 
that's I think that's what a championship disc golfer is, and De La Viega brings it out of people. I'll tell you what, it's really felt like a matter of time for Adam Hammes. I mean, when you look at the guy, way this guy's been playing, you know, remember he he started the season playing a couple of warm up tournaments in Arizona and dominating, and you're like, okay, you know, here he comes, um, and. You know, he hadn't put it together. Like, he started really slow. If you look back at Vegas, it's very interesting. He was second at the tournament in Circle 1 in regulation, 61%. You know, you, you, you think he should have finished higher than 14th where he finished. But what happened? Well, he shot 63% from Circle 1X. That's terrible. <laughs> I mean, that's that's terrible, period. By his standards, it's a nightmare. And, you know, he still shot well from circle two, but like he just didn't make enough putts. Like it's just that simple. And if you look at the rest of the season, right? So 34th at Waco, 24th at Texas State. So he has his slow start. And then he's since then he has missed the top 10. He's fifth at Jonesboro, ninth at DDO, ninth at OTB. And now, of course, he's won the Masters Cup. And when you look at his overall stats, you know, so far in 2021, his circle one and circle two in regulation looks a lot like last year. And I think the real difference makers, he's picked it up in the scramble department. He's at 63% on the year, a sixth on tour. He's parking more holes. And of course, his putter is spectacular. And if he can get his circle one X putting up to the levels that he was at this weekend, where he's over 90%, that's going to keep climbing and he's going to be in contention week in and week out. And so, I mean, I think again, this, this day law course sets up well for his game. It's not ultra long, but it requires control. And there's lots of opportunities to pick up strokes on the green. And that's why you see him win the tournament with his putting outperforming his driving which is just not something we've seen literally at any tournament this season. So you may have seen this when you were looking at the stats, but I'm going to ask it. So this, this win was a national tour win. Um, it doesn't count towards pro tour points. That's true. <laughs> unfortunate, unfortunate for uh, Adam Hammes. Um, but if you had to guess, what do you think his disc golf pro tour ranking is right now? Oh, I literally was just looking at it. Were um, you? Oh, shoot. I, <laughs> if I had had to guess uh, without having seen the number, I would have guessed around like 10th. I think I probably would have gone a little bit even lower, maybe. Um, sure. I think some of his good finishes were at National Tour. So, I, and, and like we talked about, Pro Tour really rewards top three, like sure. relative to National Tour. Um, so I probably would have said like 15. Uh, you know, top 16 uh, in terms of top half of it. Um, but he's eighth right now. Like he's he's sitting and it's early, but he's sitting in a pot lace that he'd have a buy out up to the semifinals in the Pro Tour Championship. Um, and that's kind of my marker for like, in my head, at least top performances on the year is like, where's that top eight? Like that's that's who. Sure. At any time could be making a real push at any tournament. And sure, like people outside that number can as well. But you know it's a you know Kevin Jones eleventh hasn't had the best season had a good year had a good weekend this weekend, um, but you know doing okay not great. Chris Dickerson fourteenth okay not great. I don't consider either of those guys. I haven't put them in my top five much. Kevin Jones once like they've kind of fallen out of the conversation. Adam Hammes hasn't and he's in top eight now, which is kind of in my head the cutoff line of someone who any weekend could any given weekend could be winning a tournament. So let's talk a little bit about Calvin Heimberg. Uh, we'll get to, to some of the other guys in the top five in a second. Uh, Calvin Heimberg's top five finishing streak has come to an end. And it's been epic. <laughs> Eight months of finishing inside the top five at every event. He hasn't missed a top five in, I, I, at all in 2021. And here's just some amazing numbers here. If you go to the top 10 and you stretch it out, he's only missed the top 10 twice in the last two years. Idle Wild 2020 and now Masters Cup 2021. He finished 33rd this weekend. 
It's tied for the second worst finish of his career. In 2019, he finished 57th at Ledgestone. And his very first Pro Tour event ever, he finished 33rd. Which was also Ledgestone in like 2017. And and I don't I don't bring this up to say like what's happening to Calvin Heimberg he's fallen off no, uh, you know everybody has an off weekend. It goes to show you how incredibly consistent he has been. Player of the year award last year from Ultra World Disc Golf, uh, and you can see why. I mean he has been so consistent week in and week out, just killing it. it you know finishing top five is not easy. It's not easy. Other top pros miss the top 10, and it just hasn't happened very much for Calvin Heimberg. Just locked in, but not this weekend. It didn't come together for him. Uh, it's unfortunate because I said that this was Calvin Heimberg's weekend, so yeah, I'm never sure. I'm never going to say that again. I feel personally responsible for what happened. Um, but I think, I think what's noteworthy, though, when we were looking at the stat, you said, well, when was the last time Macbeth missed top five, right? Um, and you're like, oh, Pro Tour Championship uh, and USDGC, you know, because he was injured. But like, you know, we noted Paul McBeth has a bad tournament every year. Um, I think Ricky has a bad tournament every year. <laughs> Calvin Heimberg has a, like a bad tournament every like leap year. Um, yeah, like, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, um, every four years, Calvin Heimberg is going to have one bad tournament. Uh, and two of those three bad tournaments have been Ledgestone. Like it, it's wild how consistently good he is um and it, you know he's it's it's excellent it's so it's so cool to watch I mean, it, was, it was a struggle out there for him this weekend uh in the in the final round he didn't make a single circle two putt and went 67 percent from circle one um and you know it, it, not, nothing was really working i mean he he wasn't finding the green consistently he didn't scramble ever. Um, he only made 10% of his circle two putts on the weekend. And that, that, obviously, that's just not going to get it done at De La. It's not going to get it done. So I, I certainly don't want to overly read into it. Uh, I don't think it's the best time of year to have a really bad putting performance because, you know, like Worlds is right around the corner and such a confidence and feel thing when it comes to putting. But in, on the other hand, you know, De La is very unique. Uh, if you're feeling a little jittery at all, like it's going to amplify those problems. And, you know, if you're in circle two and you're not feeling really confident that you're going to find metal or you're going to make the putt, like you're probably not going to run a lot of those because it's just, there's too much danger out there, which is a credit to the whole design, in my opinion. Um, okay. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, some other folks in the top five, James Proctor, who Seattle professional guess his rating. If I just asked you right now off the top. I I don't know. I'd probably say like 1030 low 10 thirties, maybe 1040. Really? 1040. That's <laughs> not, a, not a name you see out on regular tour pretty much plays the local tournaments in the area. Uh, he, he, he made it down to set to uh, Stockton for OTB and then of course played master's cup this weekend and he'll play some more events coming up. He's going to be at Portland. Uh, he's going to be at worlds and it looks like he's going to play more events out in the Midwest. Uh, he's currently registered for D glow and Ledgestone and Idlewild. So maybe we're going to see a little bit more of James Proctor this year. Uh, you know, last year, I don't think he played a single pro tour event. That's true. Just checked. Um, so, second place finish, almost caught Adam Hammes, and you know it's just it's one of those situations where it's like, this is somebody, obviously with a ten forty rating, who would be finishing in the top five at lots of tournaments if he played more of them. So it's not exactly a surprise to see him there, but uh, just very impressive. He he led the tournament in strokes gained from tee to green at thirteen. Uh, had a, just a tremendous final round and he had an eagle on 14, uh, was just piling up the birdies, no bogeys in the final round and uh, finished 13 under, which was second best uh, round of the weekend behind Hamas's 14 down in round one. 
uh, you know, I, I don't really have a lot to say besides I hope that players like this are able in the future to be able to make enough money playing disc golf that they can opt to go on tour. Yeah. And that's, that's the big thing is like, I think the big question about surrounding like the tour card that's coming out next year, does James Proctor get one? Right. Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's a really hard question to answer because I don't think you want to encourage if you're the pro tour, a lot of players who are like your local heroes, right. Who play local events, do certain sections of the swing um, for a couple of reasons. One, I think longevity and like consistency on tour is good for storylines. It's good for media. Uh, Two, I think it means that you get like, like players develop better. They become better players. Um, So I I think there's a lot of incentives for the pro tour to get those people with tour cards to play like a minimum number of events. And now it's noteworthy. James Proctor is playing in quite a few events this year. Um, elite series events. So it's it's not like he's like a, you know a, a one hit wonder this year or something. But it it is an interesting question about how many events are you going to have to play for Pro Card? Is that going to be a requirement? Um, this was a national tour event. Would that even count? Like it, it's so it's an interesting question. I think that James Proctor is going to challenge the Pro Tour to answer. Um, but he's a lot of he's he's a great player. He's a lot of fun to watch. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, then we got Kevin Jones, uh, you know, who's right there with, with Hammes for much of that final round. Never could really quite close the gap. Um, and, you know, ha- hit some big shots, had some, had some very nice tee shots, tap in birds, uh, but also, you know, just missed the line a few times and clip some trees, you know, get knocked down into the canyon like we talked about. Uh, just wasn't quite dialed in enough to come away with the win. And, you know, I think you got to give some, a lot of credit, frankly, to Hamas for hitting big putts in big spots when he was able to prevent Jones from picking up a stroke. Uh, but I think that, you know, it, it wasn't quite Jones's a game out there in the final round. Yeah. Um, and that's enough for the couple strokes difference that right. moved him from first to third. Right. Uh, Over on the women's side, Paige Pierce makes it her third straight win in a row. It's so funny, the difference between this tournament for the men and for the women. Because with Adam Hammes, you know, outperforming on the putting green, and that's the reason that he wins the tournament. Over on the women's side, this tournament is all about driving. Uh, Paige Pierce wins this tournament with just 1.35 strokes gained on the putting green. And many of the players in the top five were negative, um, as you mentioned earlier, Josh. She was 22 strokes gained from tee to green, however, Pierce was. So despite the fact that she only hit 69% of her Circle 1X putts, she wins the tournament by five strokes over Katrina Allen um, and, you know, is just back to playing at the levels that we expect to see from Paige Pierce after her Hawaii sojourn. In the top five, I'm gonna I'm gonna read them off real quick. So there's an important stat that I want to point out here. Katrina Allen takes second at six over par, and then three way tie, Alexis Mondahano, Kona Panis, and Juliana Corver all at seven. If you look at the final round scores, Paige Pierce shot four over par. Kona Panis, Juliana Corver, or not Kona Panis, sorry, Juliana Corver, Katrina Allen, and Alexis uh, Mondahanu all shot one over par and Paige still won by five strokes. Yeah. Like, and she was four over par in that final round after, you know, Kona Panis was in the best position to challenge her going into the final round. And then two double bogeys and a triple bogey in the front 12. Yeah. It was brutal out there. It was, it was, it took Kona out of contention completely um, for first place. But then Paige literally just can turn on cruise control yeah. Shoot worse than second and most of third, all, like almost all of the third place finishers, and still win by five strokes because of just how far ahead. If she shoots one over, like the rest of the card, then she beats Katrina Allen by nine strokes. Yeah. Like just clean, play, baby. Yeah, it, it was. Show it up was. in rounds one and two. <laughs> <laughs> it's all. It's all it takes. Um, 
It, it was it was a great performance, and uh, I know you gave me props for the Adam Hammes pick. Uh, I did pick Pierce this weekend to you win did. the tournament you because did. I was tired of losing because I did not pick Pierce. Juliana Corver is a freaking legend, man. She comes out here and finishes in third place. And I don't think anybody would say that, you know, she's got the power of some of these players that finished around her, Panis, Allen, Pierce. No way. But just tremendous line hitting ability, course management skills. And, you know, she's she's been away from like highly competitive disc golf for a long many years decades (laughs) and comes out here and and finishes tied for third and like you know was on the lead card after the first round i mean what an awesome what an awesome story to see jk back out here because it's one thing for a player like this to come back out and play some events and it's like everybody's like oh nostalgia you know ken climo throws out the opening tee shot at usdgc and it's like (laughs) oh we all feel so good but like no jk (laughs) is like competing competing um and you know like in the final round she led the field in strokes gained from tita green you know just like such a cool story she ended up finishing second in tita green performance this weekend well Um, you ready for this i'm ready first in park percentage first in circle one in regulation and second in birdie percentage on the weekend wow she had a rough putting weekend she could have won the tournament if the putter was going. Yeah. She didn't even need the putter going. If Just like... Not if, going bad. Right, right. If the putter was not actively hurting her performance, yeah. she could have won the tournament. Um, yeah, it was... It's so cool. And it's noteworthy. We talked about this. The reason Juliana Corver is back is because of how well she said she loved the Pro Tour events. How well they were run how prestigious they felt, how professional they felt they were run. And now you have a legend back in the game who is challenging for the win. Like top top three, podium finish, thanks I to wonder, that. I wonder what's going to happen when she goes back to freestyle, when that gets going again. That's going to be the big question. Yeah. I, mean, I hope we get to see her play more. Uh, you know, at least the events, you know, in her neck of the woods once it comes out to the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, very, very cool to see. Um yeah, you know, yeah, you, you hope to see a little bit more of a battle this weekend. You know, Panis is only a couple strokes off the lead coming into the final round. Uh, but it feels like just, you know, another weekend where Pierce didn't really get challenged in the final round when it when, you know, after the first few holes. Uh, we had, you know, Haley King with a chance to 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 push Page last weekend didn't happen. Uh, Panis, you know, three putts on hole 3, takes the double bogey while Pierce birdies and like, ugh, that was kind of it right there. And, and, you know, a couple, a, a triple bogey and a double bogey later, it was basically over. And like you said, Pierce in cruise control. So it all is kind of leading up to worlds. We're getting there <laughs> and we'll talk about it on a future show for sure. Uh, before we leave this topic and talk with Adam Hammes here on the upshot, I do want to just come back to the one quick thing here about live coverage. You know, there was no live coverage this weekend. They couldn't figure it out. It was all post-production. What did you think of the tournament uh, consumption experience without having the live coverage? And what do you think that means for the future of this tournament? So I think it, it, I've got I've got two thoughts on this. The first of which is I don't typically watch full live coverage. Like I don't watch all three days live coverage every round. I just don't have time for it. I work on Fridays usually. Uh, you know, I, I, just, I cannot watch that much live coverage. Um, but... I do know, and I didn't even realize how much I do it, but like my lunch break on Friday, I'll jump on the live coverage and I'll watch an hour and I'll check the scores and I'll just kind of see what the feel of the tournament is, get some of the commentary. Same thing Saturday. I've got things I'm doing, but I'll jump on halfway through the MPO round and I'll catch that. It was weird having to wait for everything for Jomez. And like I went back to the, I was staying off social media. I was trying not to get any, like I didn't want to be on Twitter because I didn't want people posting you to scores. And I know like the PDGA, the pro tour, both are tweeting scores as it's happening. And I was actively trying to disengage from disc golf, except for the round, you know, once Joe Mez finally released right. it, because I did not want to find that out. Um, 
Whereas when it's live coverage, I'm more comfortable just like catching pieces of it and then just still staying involved. So I think, I think it's worrisome how much I felt myself checking out to intentionally wait for the Jomez coverage, which is not something that we've had to do lately since the Disc Golf Network became you know, big and effective. But the second thing, like you talked about, is that this tournament is exceptional. Uh, like the, the experience of watching it is exceptional. And so I think that thanks to that, that De La Viega can survive until the live coverage technology becomes available or the budget or, you know, whatever it needs to be. Um, I, I think I really do think it can. I don't think it can thrive, though, until we get to that point, just because of the way that people have to engage with the disc golf media. I mean, here's the thing you miss with without having live, not just I mean, besides the obvious, like not being able to pop on your lunch break. We don't get to experience the James Proctor run at all. And like, if you want to tell me that it's good enough to watch the lead card coverage and the chase card coverage, I just don't agree with you. Like the problem with the post-production formats is the hyper focus on exclusively what's going on on the shots on that card. I mean, you barely hear about the fact that James Proctor is about to tie the tournament and the live coverage doesn't have that problem. And, you know, for that's why I want to watch the live. Like it's not about some like, you know, moral thing or anything like that. It's like, literally, I just want to experience what is happening at the tournament in like the totality of the sense of it. The, the exclusive focus on the four players on the card that's happening right there really takes away from the enjoyment of the event overall. Like, sure, it's great to watch every shot from the players on the lead card or whatever, but you're missing such an important part of the story when you're not seeing what else is going on. And now, does this happen every weekend? No, a lot of times the lead card is the only thing that matters. And so you kind of get the full story of the final round, let's say, with that lead card coverage only. But it's just, it's a massive shortcoming for the post-production format. And there's many things that make post-production kind of better. It's efficient to watch. You're getting pro player insights who have played the course that day. So they know exactly what the conditions are like and what the holes are like. Um, you know, and it's crisp and it's it's in beautiful HD, you know, everything perfect. But those things are important to me, but not as much as the like stories themselves that are unfolding in real time. And again, this is why we're going to trend and continue and continue and continue to trend towards more live, more money's going to go into live, more cameras going to go into live, the transmission's going to get better. And this is just where we're heading. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. So I don't know what that's going to mean. We obviously, if you want to go back and listen to our post-production and live production future episodes from over the winter. I would highly encourage that because we kind of discussed this stuff at length. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I missed I missed the live this weekend, but at, I agree with you. And we talked about it last week and I, I have not changed my mind. This tournament should remain on the Elite Series, 100%. Absolutely. Regardless of what, what the media situation is. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, Adam Hammes will join us here on The Upshot. Stay with us. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. If you've got a pound bag, you can also get a Pound Ambassador patch out now. You want to rep your favorite pound carrying pro? Well, they've got patches, $10, 100% of the profit from each one sold goes directly to the ambassador. So whether you want to rep Nate Sexton, Kona Panis, Jeremy Colling, Lisa Fakus, Dustin Keegan, Scott Withers, or Zoe Andike, they've got the patches up on pounddiscgolf.com. Go check them out. Joining us now on the upshot is the winner of the 2021 Masters Cup, Adam Hammes. Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm sorry that Josh couldn't join us as well, but uh, looking forward to having a, a conversation with you about this weekend. I mean, first and foremost, you know, first Elite Series win. This is something that uh, there's a lot of players out there who are very good, are still chasing. Uh, what does it mean to you to finally get one under your belt? Uh, it's a big sigh of relief. I know everything I put into disc golf in the last, you know, 10 years of playing has finally paid off. And it's like it was the greatest feeling in the world. Um, it's hard to explain that feeling. Um, it's, it's still setting in right now. And um, it's just bittersweet. And it's, it's been great. With the, you know, the Masters Cup, such an interesting course, uh, you know, De La, a lot different than than what the other tracks we've seen on tour this season. Um, how is that adjustment for you? You know, we're, we're playing a lot of very long bomber open type courses coming into this, you know, very suddenly quite different uh, style of, of tournament. Is that an easy or a difficult adjustment to make? Um, it can be a difficult adjustment. Um, I went in. So I got right after OTB open, I went literally to the bail the next day. I was there Monday, practicing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I was practicing for, you know, the week and a half before the event even started. And for me on a course like that, um, it's all about reps. Um, a big open golf course, you can kind of just go out and just, you know, read the wind and kind of just throw your shot and you can kind of land, you know, anywhere. But on a course like Daylight, you have to be so precise. So just getting out there and getting comfortable on each hole, finding the disc for each shot, finding the disc for almost every tee shot. You almost have to like build a special bag for Dela almost. And uh, just getting reps, feeling comfortable, and then feeling confident and just making good shots in practice is really big. And just watching yourself do it more than once. Because I know a lot of turns where I'll only get maybe two practice rounds, maybe three, and maybe only, you know, like say hole four or something, I only get one good one good tee shot off in practice. And it's like, all right, well, I got one off, so I at least know I've done it before. A course like Dela, you really have to go out there and throw multiple, multiple good shots in practice to be able to feel comfortable out there, so. That was my, you know, kind of goal going into the event and worked out nicely. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as the key elements to success at Dela? Uh, I think Dela is 100% mental. I mean, you, you can have like the worst breaks ever, obviously. But if you uh, have a positive attitude, which I try to keep the whole tournament, I think I did a pretty good job of. And uh, just, you know, take each shot one by one. Don't take anything for granted, even your 40-foot layups to the the rooted sketchy greens you got to really focus down and lock in on those because anything can really happen um yeah you know there's obviously bad breaks at almost any tournament but i mean i think de La maybe delivers them on a more regular basis than than some other courses uh everybody's going to have some rollaways here and there it did seem like there were times when maybe you were a little bit frustrated particularly in round two uh how do you how do you play through those moments of frustration uh, you know, just my, the frustration I showed, uh, in this tournament wasn't like, uh, like really getting down on myself. It wasn't like really negative, um, frustration. Like I have been in the past. It was just kind of like, what the heck dude, like, let's go. Like you're better than that. Just bounce back on the next hole and just kind of like a, just like a firm, like, let's go kind of to myself. That's all it really was. So, um, just, you know, shake it off, just get right back on track on the next hole and try to secure a birdie on the next one and bounce back right away. Do you think that, uh, adjusting your attitude towards competition towards disc golf is is a part of the reason that you you know have been finding a little bit more success lately and, and now winning this tournament uh 100 percent um obviously in the past i'm known you know for you know getting frustrated showing a lot more emotion than most guys and uh the big thing i've been working on this year is just you know trying to stay as positive as possible and not showing as much emotion on the course, just trying to stay more of level headed, you know, keel and stuff like that. And, um, I've been saying this a bunch, but GBO, you know, a few weeks back was a really good learning experience for me because I had a really good first round where I stayed positive in the front nine and I finished the back positive. And then the second round, I kind of had like a really shaky front nine and I was just like super negative and just like wasn't there mentally. And it resulted in a, a bad finish. So I had a really bad second round. And then the third round, I, you know, started positive and finished it positive. So I was like, man, if you can really just, you know, start positive, stay like positive throughout the, you know, the first couple holes, whatever happens, doesn't matter. Um, you're going to end the, the, the rounds going to finish in the way you want it. And, uh, I think it really showed, you know, at GBO. So coming over to the West coast, I had like one goal in mind in the first turn we played was master or OTB. OTB I did a pretty good job of, I had a couple slip ups mentally in there uh, that I uh, recognized. And then coming into master's cup, I was like, all right, you are not getting mad in this tournament. You, um, 
you have to stay focused the whole time. And uh, I think it's going to pay off. And I think it, it was a big emotional thing for me. And it was, it was a really big, you know, thing for me. Felt good. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, did you, you know, you've, you've come close to, to winning an elite series event before. I mean, you know, you go head to head, Calvin Heimberg back at the hall of fame classic in 2019. Did you draw on that experience at all this weekend? Um, a little bit. Um, that was two years ago and my game was a lot different then. my putting style was different. My throw is different. My sidearm is different now. So I think I'm better. Like I have more well-rounded game right now. So, um, I don't know, not, not a whole lot. Um, definitely was like, okay, like, you know, you're here before, um, maybe it's your time. So I was definitely like locked down and let's, let's do this. And I knew what, I knew what, what I had to do to be in that position. I knew I, you know, like I failed in the past and, you know, all right, maybe you just need to focus extra a little bit more and, you know, a couple shots that you know can, can cost you or lose you the tournament, you know? So I'm really curious to know about how much scoreboard watching you were doing down the stretch. Uh, obviously, you know, you were in a tight race with Kevin Jones pretty much throughout the round. You know, you had the advantage most pretty much the entire way, but it was close. But but then on the other hand, you know, you got James Proctor roaring up uh, from behind you at did you know that was happening and were you adjusting your shot selection or your game at all based on where things were on the scorecard? Um, not, not really change, um, how I'm attacking the course or any like mentally mental things like that. Just, um, you know, try to stay ahead of Kevin. And, um, I didn't realize that Proctor was doing what he was doing until I think Jeff Corns told me with maybe like five or six to play, but he didn't really like, make it so it was like all right you need to like bury the next like four holes or you're going to be like losing this tournament he was like just just keep going just get a couple more birdies just just keep playing daylight just keep playing the golf you've been playing all week and this thing will end up in your favor so i kind of just you know just listen to jeff and we went from there and everything turned out fine i mean did you know on 24 that i guess what you needed a par right did you were you aware of that or were you just trying to play the best shots possible no, so going to the last two holes, I knew that uh, J- or Jeff told me that James uh, parred hole 23. So Jeff was like, okay, you just need to par this hole too. Just stay with him. You have him by two right now. And then uh, James, uh, so I threw it long, laid up, got my three, got my par on hole 23. And then going to the last hole, Jeff said par wins the tournament. He goes, you can just start your zone off the tee and pitch up. And I just listened to him and we did that. Awesome. So, uh, we were talking earlier in the show. Your strokes gained on the putting green outperformed your strokes gained from tee to green. That's the first time a an MPO player has won a tournament like that this year, and I think it's probably very rare just in general. Um, does it feel like the putting is really the key at De La, given how many dangerous greens that there are, or do you think clean tee shots are still the kind of the key element as it as it often is on, on a disc golf course uh, I think it's a combination of both Adela um you got to be putting well because um you know you can put yourself you can throw those you can throw in a crazy tight hyzer flip line whatever it is and, you know put the disc 25 feet from the basket and if you're not making the birdie putt you're not scoring so you can throw an amazing amazing tee shot and then still like the putt so I think like you know making a good tee shot making a good putt is really good out there um it's really hard to park holes out there so for me, having to make a bunch of long putts is just what I like to do. So I was pretty comfortable um, outside of six, inside of sixty feet. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of wind out there, so I can kind of just put the putter up how I want it and the flight I want looking for, and uh, you know trust that it's going to fall in the basket. So I want to kind of go back to early in the year at Las Vegas Challenge. You actually played great off the tee, but mm-hmm. you were struggling in Circle One. Uh, was that just early season jitters? I mean, I, in some ways, you know, you, you come off those two preseason wins where, you, you know, you mm-hmm. look, you're, you're just dominating. It's just interesting to see, like, early in the year, it was not your driving that was causing you to kind of fall back down the leaderboard. It was the putting a little bit. And so I'm just curious to know, like, how you refine that stroke. Obviously, you know, everybody understands that you're one of the best putters on earth. Uh, and that you know how you put all the pieces together this weekend after you know a couple bumpy start to the year and the first couple tournaments but then you know you've been in the top 10 since uh i don't know last couple couple months Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think just um, I think they're just really well at Vegas. It was uh, Vegas is pretty wide open, so um, it's pretty sure. hard to like find find a lot of trouble out there. But uh, I think me throwing the disc at like uh, Waco and Texas States was pretty bad. Um, I mean, I spent my Arizona my my off season in Arizona. We don't have a lot of um, you know wooded shots there. There's not too many like hyzer lines or hyzer flip lines, low ceiling like golf golf lines, I should say. Uh, it's more of just like Spike Heiser onto like dead grass, stuff like that. So we're just, there was really no finesse game the whole off season. So I think that kind of showed in like the first couple events of the year. And uh, that's, that's part of the reason I wasn't getting off the tee. And then uh, my putting, my putting at Vegas was a little off. Um, I was struggling at like 20, 25 feet for some reason. I just had like the yips from like 20 feet. Sometimes I get that. I had one in the final round where I missed 20 feet. And I was like, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like mental laps and I miss a 20 footer. Um, I don't really think about it too much. Um, I'm pretty confident on the putting green. Um, I'm not really worried going in tournaments, so I'm going to putt. Usually, I can you know go out there and putt how I how I want to each and every week, which is pretty nice to have. And uh, usually, getting off the tee is tough for me. Um, in the past, uh, I've had to just you know all my some of my biggest tournament wins, my eight tiers, um, it's just been like insane putting performances because you know I'm not putting myself under the basket or to 20 feet every time. I'm putting myself into circle two regulation every time, and I'm making long putts. You know to right. score. And, uh, I think that's like the reason I'm so good at putting is because, you know, I am not putting the disc very close every time. So I have to, you know, <laughs> make those putts to score. And I've just kind of taught and like learned how to make long putts consistently, I guess. <laughs> I uh, mean, the circle yeah. two, I mean, you hit some insane putts all weekend. I mean, some huge pressure moments in that final round too, with Kevin Jones parked and you not in good position. And then you're still making putts from a knee or, from 60 feet um you, you know when when you look back at 2019 when when you lost to calvin at hall of fame you, you mentioned that your game is a lot different how has your game changed like specifically since then that you know now puts you in a position to go head-to-head -head kevin jones and get the win uh, I just think my form is just like a little more like defined. Um, I think it was like a little whippy and snappy back in the day and just caused some inconsistencies. I think, uh, you know, I've filled out a little bit more, I have a little more muscle cause I've worked in, uh, in the gym a little bit in the past couple off seasons. So I think it's like stable, stabled out my like body and I just, uh, corresponding to more consistent lines. I can hit my angles a little bit better. Um, just, just a little more consistent with the disc. Um, I know I can put it um, on better lines than I than I know I could have uh, in 2019. Uh, my putt style is a little bit different. I used to do that like jump straddle putt uh, back in 2019 when I made all those big ones, and now I'm just like mainly just stand still. And uh, I rarely jump putt unless I'm outside like 90 or it's like a on, like low ceiling layup or something like that. So just a couple things that just I think are a little like a little crisper. Um, just. Mm -hmm weeding out the inconsistencies in my throw and stuff like that. I just think it's my, my throw is a little bit better. Where do you see yourself in the disc golf echelon? Do you think you're a top tier player? I mean, I, I I'm kind of leaving this vague on purpose. I want, I'm curious for your answer. Uh, I definitely believe I'm a top 10 player in the world. Um, I think after this past week, I definitely proved it. Um, I think my putting every week is outperforming most people. And, um, you know, if I can just get my drives where I want them more consistent and uh, just stay level headed and stay positive, like I've been talking about, I think there's a lot, a lot in store for me. Do you think, I mean, did you expect to win an elite series event this year? Or does this feel like, wow, you know, I've reached this achievement that I didn't know that I would ever get to? Uh, I didn't expect to, but I had one goal coming in this year, and it was win a disc golf pro tour or national tour. So, pretty hyped to uh, to get one. There almost, you, you know, it's still it's it's pretty early in the season. Still, we still have a lot of tournaments left. So to be able to do it, you know, now is pretty great because you know there's still a chance to maybe do it again this year and you know win two of them. So I'm pretty excited to get one now. And you know, Masters Cup is is an insane, prestigious event to win, and it's crazy. So yeah, I'm. You know, there's been discussion, uh, and we talked about it on the show about you know no live coverage. Uh, this is very old school course, crossing fairways, whole deal. How do you feel about De La and its place on tour? Um, De La's fine. Uh, De La is a type of golf that we don't really have um, anywhere else in the country. It's a different style. I think a lot of guys criticize it. I know I've criticized it in the past. Um, um, 
yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's interesting. I think it's good. I think I think it's very enjoyable for fans to watch. Um, I think they really really enjoy watching the you know the, the anything can happen aspect of of a course. You know, it's just not like oh they're just just landing the fairway. It's like whatever they. It's really fun to watch for the fans, and I think that's why you know it's gotten the reputation it has, um, and the and the fame and everything that's gone into this tournament from years and years and years ago. So. Uh, I really enjoyed De La. I think it, um, so my home course back in Wisconsin, Sandy Point is, uh, it's similar to De La. It doesn't have like the elevation. You're not going to, you're just going to roll 200 feet off a cliff and you're never going to see it again. Um, but it has the roots on the green. It has the soft landings. You got to, you know, approach into the greens and stuff like that. So throwing smooth putter shots and s- just speed control coming into like sketchy greens. Uh, I definitely have that skill. Um, cause I've won tournaments at my home course and, I think that really helped and corresponded over to De La. Got it. But all in all, but all in all, De La, you know, De La is beautiful. Uh, you can't really beat De La. It is beautiful. It's very beautiful. Um, where does this put you mentally heading towards Worlds? Just a couple of weeks away. Uh, it, it puts me in a really good spot, you know, um, to, to achieve this right before Worlds is, you know, exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't think it was going to happen. I mean, I did think it was going to happen eventually, but I didn't like think it was going to happen right before worlds like this um i think it's great um just looking forward to you know the next couple and then you know just really dialing in for worlds i think there's a lot of cool things that are going to happen soon so pretty excited where do you set the bar for worlds are you trying to i mean obviously everybody's trying to win everything but like is winning the only thing that will feel satisfying or do you have uh you know a top 10 kind of finish in mind uh i've taken 10th the world before so i think um you know i think top five Top five would be the goal. Obviously, the goal is to win it. Um, but you know, if you don't have a couple, you know, have a couple bad stretches of holes, and maybe the win isn't in the picture anymore. Uh, I think a top five finish would be very good, very good for me. Do you think it means anything that Garrett Gerthy won his first Elite Series event at De La in? Where I I shouldn't just say De La. There was also the golf course at the time, uh, but at Masters Cup in in 2019, and then now you've won your first Elite Series event at uh, Masters Cup. Um, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Um, Garrett was there rooting me on the whole week after the first round. He's like, bro, you got this. Like, I know you can do it. And, uh, it was really, really cool. Uh, he was encouraging me the whole tournament and then the, right after the event, he was right there. And it was just, it was a really cool moment having, you know, the defending champion there and Garrett rooting me on. He's believing in me. He's like, bro, this is going to be your first big one. This is sick. And it's just really cool that like Dale, I was both our very first, like, you know, big event we've won. So pretty sweet moment for Garrett and I. All right. Well, uh, well, now that you've won a, a disc golf pro tour or a national tour event, you reset a goal at this point. Um. Yeah. Win another one. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a disc golf pro tour. It'd be cool to have a pro tour and a national tour, and then you know maybe a major soon. Who knows? <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for thanks for coming on with us, and uh, good luck at the Portland Open this week. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. All right, Adam Hammes with us here on The Upshot. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Upshot. Thanks again to Adam for stopping by. Josh, sorry you couldn't make it, but uh, really nice to, to hear from Adam. And, uh, you know, he's got one under his belt. Now he's going for number two. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think... Uh, you know, we talked about it. He's, he says he puts himself top 10. I don't think that's unreasonable right now. I think he's reached that caliber. He's demonstrating it well and, uh, you know, and he's playing well. So it was, it was good to have him. You know, it was also fun. I, I really enjoyed seeing the kind of variety of players that we got to watch on lead cards this weekend. Uh, and, and, you know, if you, if you, if you dig deeper into the coverage, maybe you get more of that, but you know, you look at that final round and you've got Adam Hammes, Kevin Jones, James Conrad, Drew Gibson. Uh, they all are very different players, different styles, different strengths and weaknesses. And I just think that's pretty cool to see. A lot of times we get, uh, you know, the same names again and again, number one. But number two, also very similar styles uh, of player. You know, the, the extremely well-rounded, long-throwing top five in the world guys that we see week in and week out. Um to have none of those players on a lead card for a tournament in the final round and to see such a variety of skills on display and different shot 
shaping and and decision making uh is a such it's just such a treat uh, relative to you know what we can sometimes get where everyone throws the same shots no absolutely and i think that like you said i mean you can go down chase card coverages especially at tournaments that have two three four media crews um covering you know mpo and you can you can find a lot of variety it's a little bit different though when someone on the lead card like whips out a thumber though right like they're <laughs> they're challenging for the 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 lead and they they pull out the thumber or uh i don't even know what to call big germs crazy over the arm head throw thing that he did Amazing. on on coverage like on a lead card when it matters so i i think that it's just, it's a little different it is different i like it too I want to give a shout out really quick. James Conrad got an ace on hole 20, a.k.a. Gravity. Um, And he said in an interview after the round that he'd gotten the ace in practice and decided that he was going to go for the ace in the turn. And I'm like, this dude is throwing putts from the tee into the basket. Like, this is just on a next level situation here i mean as soon as it leaves the hand it's going straight to the chains i mean it's just an unbelievable skill to me and you know imagine intentionally aiming for the ace knowing that you can get the ace and then getting the ace (laughs) in a tournament of this caliber it's just it's just an amazing thing you know like everyone's like wow i got a crazy ace but no james was like yeah no i i mean i got it in practice i knew i could get it and i went for it (laughs) I, I think what's funny about it, uh, back in, I think the 2019, maybe, yeah, I think the 2019 Masters Cup, uh, Matt Bell on that real short uh, turning a right hole hits chains and drops right in front of the basket. And I remember Nate Sexton said on commentary, he's like, that was a terrible shot. Like he got lucky because it hit chains, but it was a terrible shot because if he misses, he's a mile long. And that's the same thing here is James like James like I could have gotten the birdie and I decided to throw the ace instead, um, knowing full well that I mean you miss that bogey's not unrealistic and on that hole. So it it's do you ever do that, Charlie? Do you walk up to holes and say I think I'm going to ace this one now just because I can? Never happened in my whole life. <laughs> yeah. I, it's I'm wild. still aceless after still like aceless. five years or whatever. <laughs> I come really close, but no aces yet. I, uh, it look, looks like you just need to intentionally play for it more that's often. What, that's what I'm learning. That's what I'm learning. <laughs> I watch the professionals to learn the craft. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, if it, if really cool to see, you know, if only we could see the roller ace from Barsby from however many years ago it was now. Uh, that that is one of those, you know, pre-video era disc golf legends, myths almost. Um, all right, well, that is going to do it for this edition of the Upshot. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, we're back later this week with a second episode. We're doing it. We're going to get you ready for Portland Open, and we're going to look ahead to the weekend. Um, and uh, hey, we're getting closer to World, so. Stay tuned. More to come. We've got some new segments coming your way starting soon and really excited. Always let us know if you have any feedback for us. Upshot at ultiworld.com is the best way to reach us. For Josh, I'm Charlie saying so long and we'll talk to you next week right here on The Upshot. <laughs>